Good morning and welcome. It's not quite as warm this morning as it was last week, but uh, I understand the air conditioner still isn't working quite properly, but at least this morning we had some breeze and uh, there was no humidity, so that makes a big difference. And if I'm any gauge of the way it is, the sweat isn't running off of me like it was last week, so. <laughs> Let's begin this time of worship with these words. <clears throat> To worship is to stand in awe under a heaven of stars before a flower, a leaf in sunlight, or a grain of sand. To worship is to be silent, receptive, before a tree astir with the wind or the passing shadow of a cloud. To worship is to work with dedication and skill. It is to pause from work and listen to a strain of music. To worship is to sing with the singing beauty of the earth. It is to listen through a storm to the still small voice within. Worship is the mystery within us reaching out to the mystery beyond. Let's bow for prayer. Holy God, you call us together to reflect on your world. Be with us now as we sing and pray together so that we can hear your voice and understand your way. We pray these things in Jesus' name, amen. Hey, let's open our blue hymnals to hymn number 66, O Worship the King, number 66, and let's stand, please. Our first scripture this morning is from Luke 12, verses 49 to 56. 
Luke 12, verses 49 to 56, and if you want to follow along, it's found in the Pew Bible on page 738. I came to cast fire on the earth, and would, and would that it were already kindled. I have, sorry, there's a weird shadow up here. <laughs> I have a baptism to be baptized with, and how great is my distress until it is accomplished. Do you think that I have come to give peace on earth? No, I tell you, but rather division. For from now on in one house there will be five divided, three against two and two against three. They will be divided, father against son and son against father, mother against daughter and daughter against mother, mother-in-law against daughter-in-law, and daughter-in-law against mother-in-law. He also said to the crowds, when you see a cloud rising in the west, you say at once, a shower is coming. And so it happens. And when you see the south wind blowing, you say, there will be scorching heat, and it happens. You hypocrites, you know how to, to interpret the appearance of earth and sky, but why do you not know how to interpret the present time? Let's bow for our offering prayer. Generous God, maker of all things, through your goodness you have blessed us with good gifts, ourselves, our time, and our possessions. We receive these gifts in gratitude and offer them to the world with your love. We pray in the name of the one who gave us his life for us, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. And as usual, the plate is in the back there, and uh, you can also mail it in or do it online now, I guess, from what I understand. So. Okay, let's turn to your purple Sing the Story books. Uh, they should be in the pews in front of you number 49, and let's sing, I will come to you in the silence. And let's stand, please.
<clears throat> Our second scripture is from the book of Hebrews, chapter 11, verses 29 to chapter 12, verse 2. It's found in the Pew Bible on page 852. By faith, the people crossed the Red Sea as on dry land. But the Egyptians, when they attempted to do the same, were drowned. By faith, the walls of Jericho fell down after they had been encircled for seven days. By faith, Rahab the prostitute did not perish with those who were disobedient, because she had given a friendly welcome to the spies. And what more shall I say? For time would fail to tell me of Gideon, Barak, Samson, Jephthah, of David and Samuel, and the prophets, who through faith conquered kingdoms, enforced justice, obtained promises, stopped the mouths of lions, quenched the power of fire, escaped the edge of the sword, were made strong out of weakness, became mighty in war, put foreign enemies to flight. Women received back their dead by resurrection, some were tortured, refusing to accept release so that they might rise again to a better life. Others suffered mocking and flogging and even chains and imprisonment. They were stoned. They were sewn in two. They were killed with the sword. They went about in skins of sheep and goats, destitute, afflicted, mistreated, of whom the world was not worthy wandering about in deserts and mountains and in dens and caves of the earth. And all these, though commended through their faith, did not receive what was promised, since God had provided something better for us, that apart from us they should not be made perfect. Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. Good morning, again. <laughs> it's great to be with you here today on this beautiful end of summer day with the breeze coming through the windows. Something to be thankful for. And hello to all of you They are worshiping from home. Um, we miss you here in person, but we're glad to have you with us. Welcome, everybody. Our passages today speak to the idea of transformation, of how God makes things including us, new and better. The Luke passage has Jesus talking about fire and baptism. Both of those things are refining agents. Fire, though it burns and destroys some of which it chars, it also creates new things. Like when fire hits sand, the heat makes glass. Some trees in the forest actually require periodic burns in order for the seeds to be exposed and plant themselves in the soil. Baptism immerses believers in living water. We go in one way, and in an act of love and surrender to God, under the water, we come out different. Like when Noah emerged from the flood and the world was made new. Also in the Luke passage, Jesus tries really hard to make an important point. And we know this because he's using hyperbole, like massive exaggeration. It was a common literary tool in the ancient Near East to get through to people who might be hearing something new and different for the first time. Hyperbole is hard hitting, it's memorable. And here Jesus tells us that he hasn't come to bring peace, but division. And he says families will split. There's going to be fire on earth. It sounds like an apocalypse. It sort of is. 
Jesus' coming marked a time of revealing the truth about God's relationship with creation, a truth that required something radical to happen in order for creation to be redeemed and saved. So while Jesus doesn't necessarily mean that families will literally split or that he came to bring division, not reconciliation, or war, not peace. I mean, these things don't quite sound like Jesus, do they? He's trying to make the point that his redeeming presence on earth changes everything. It's not the status quo anymore. The old ways of thinking and doing things aren't going to work anymore. They aren't going to save us. It's a time of radical change, of getting rid of the yuck, of coming up out of the flood into a new world, of seeding a new forest, of making beautiful glass out of sand. And thank God, right? So that's the big picture. Now, Hebrews essentially says the same thing, but it's a more personal, more intimate message. It says, therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders us and the sin that so easily entangles us. And let us run with perseverance the race that was marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and the perfecter of our faith. For the joy set before him, he endured the cross scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand, the right throne of Father God. This is a remarkable passage. It so tenderly speaks of our human condition and of God's love and grace and mercy. And it totally changes how the world wants us to feel about our flaws and our mistakes. Turns it on its head, actually. The world wants us to be ashamed of our shortcomings, to hide them in secret, to push them down where we don't have to think about them anymore, to pretend we're perfect when we are far from it, to strive and strive and strive to make up for the good and right things we didn't do, or for the bad things we did do. That's how the world wants us to feel. Shame that weighs us down, inevitable imperfections that stop us from becoming who God wants us to be. And these things hamper our relationship with God. Yet, whose world is this anyway? Second Corinthians says, Satan, who is the god of this world, has blinded the minds of those who do not believe. They are unable to see the glorious light of the good news. They don't understand this message about the glory of Christ, who is the exact likeness of God. When we get sucked down into the world's ways of shaming and unforgiveness and accusations, we know we are steeped in Satan's ways. These are not Jesus' ways. Hebrews offers us a new and better way to live life here on earth as we await the coming of the kingdom. First, as the body of Christ, there is no shame among us. We don't shame one another. We don't fall into the ways of Satan, the accuser. Nor do we fall for the distraction from ungodly sources. Fixing our eyes on Jesus gives us strength and restraint and discipline. And when we fail, which we most certainly will do, we don't address shame on our own. We do it in community, among our cloud of witnesses. That's us. Yet, admitting our shortcomings, our failures, things we wish we hadn't done, makes us super vulnerable. It's uncomfortable. But if we don't throw it off, it'll hinder our salvation. 
It'll entangle us in a way that we can never be the people God wants us to be. It stops us from relating to God. Like when Adam and Eve hid from God in the garden after they took the fruit. So whatever you're ashamed of, whatever is in your past or your present that gives you that awful, regretful, dark feeling associated with shame, it's time to throw it off. Get untangled from it. It's time to scorn our shame like Jesus did on the cross to undo its effects so that we can join Jesus at the throne of God. Many of us feel that we should be ashamed about the bad things we've done in order to be good enough, clean enough to be with God. Like, we have to be perfect before God will accept us. Yet nothing can be further from the truth. God loves us, you and me, even with our flaws, even with our past, even in all the ways we miss the mark of perfection. That is the actual meaning of sin, missing the mark. And by fixing our eyes on Jesus, we're saying to Satan, the accuser, no more. I will not be bound or entangled or hindered anymore. You don't get to define me. You don't get to reduce me to my worst aspects because I've got better things to feel and do besides hang out in your world, Satan. And no matter my past or present, I love God and I want to be with God now. That's what we say. This is how we scorn shame. This is how we lay aside every weight and the sin that clings to us so closely. This is how we run with perseverance the race that is set before us. This is how we perfect our faith so that we can sit with Jesus on the throne of God. Is it any surprise that Satan doesn't want us to do that? And while releasing our shame and turning over those stones in our hearts and our psyches that have bugs and rot underneath them, once those bugs clear out and the rot is wiped away, once the sunlight hits it, new and better things can grow. Like some of you, I walk a lot. It's for exercise, but it's also to clear my mind and spend time with God. And when no one's around while I'm walking, I sometimes even speak out loud to God. About a month ago, I had read the passage that we have today, Hebrews 12, 1 through 2. And I had a vision while I was walking, so I'm going to share it with you. I thought about all the things I was ashamed of in my life. The things that weighed me down, the things I wished hadn't happened. Lessons I'd wished I'd learned earlier and faster. People I'd hurt, rules I might have broken. Times when I wasn't very compassionate or worse, when I let anger be replaced by love, or love, <laughs> anger replaced love. When I messed up, when I was impatient, maybe a little righteous or judgmental, or critical. When I was your basic, imperfect human. <laughs> and in my, vis in my vision, I named all those things, and I put them in a big garbage bag, and I lug it to a picnic table where I meet Jesus. And I hoist my bag of garbage and shameful things on the table, and it's heavy. It is a disgusting, rotten mess. I don't like it. And Jesus ignores the bag and sits down with me at the picnic table. So I sit down opposite him, and we chit-chat for a while. We laugh and we reminisce. And then as we're talking, Jesus opens the bag and begins taking my shame sources out one by one until the bag is empty. And I panic a bit as he's seeing these things. I feel exposed. But he doesn't seem phased. And out of these, these things, he makes a very large sandwich. 
like a dagwood. It's messy and it stinks. It does not look appetizing to me at all. And I beg him not to eat it. Please don't eat that thing. But he ignores me and we just keep chit-chatting. Like nothing is happening. And he eats that nasty shame sandwich with gusto. It can't taste good. Lots of napkins are required. And I feel sorry for him. And he says, this is what I do out of love for you. You would do it to heal your children. So what can I do but sit and watch him eat? And he takes one last bite of the enormous sandwich, licks his fingers, and it's gone. He sips some wine. Then he gets up from the table and goes down into a valley where I can't see him anymore. Something is happening, I don't know what. Some sort of process. Soon though, I see him coming up over the hill and he's smiling grandly at me, holding the most voluptuous bouquet of flowers that I have ever seen has all my fla favorite flowers in it, and some I've never seen. It's a feast for the senses. Some of them smell good, some of them look gorgeous, some of them taste good, some of them feel like soft kitten ears. I can't, receive, I can't resist receiving this beautiful bouquet. I kiss and I hug Jesus, and I tell him thank you through tears of joy. And I go home and I keep these flowers in a vase until they're dry. And then I plant the seeds and I watch them grow again. And I give the flowers to others, I give them to you. That's how we scorn shame, friends, together in a cloud of witnesses with Jesus. That's how we receive and also extend grace, love, and mercy to ourselves and to others. That's how we become new and better. That's how we close the gap between earth and heaven. That's the good news. I'm going to end by reading again from Revelation as we did last week. Please close your eyes. Just receive this word. And I saw a new heaven and a new earth. And for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away. And chaos was no more. And I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, See, the home of God is among mortals. God will dwell with them, and they will be God's people, and God will be with them. God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. Death will be no more. Mourning and crying and pain will be no more. For the first things have passed away. And the one who was seated on the throne said, See, I am making all things new. Amen. Let's stand and sing. We are often tossed and driven and sing the story number 72. <laughs>
Let's pray. Jesus, thank you for showing us how to scorn shame, for being approachable even with our giant bag of shortcomings, for making our shame sandwiches into something new and better. Help us extend the grace, love, and mercy you've shown us to ourselves and all others to be your face of love in this time. God, we align our wills to yours as we pray for the joys and concerns we heard earlier. And in this moment of silence, hear the prayers of your people. We pray also for our enemies to become friends, that the hungry and poor have plenty, that the oppressed be uplifted and justice be done, that all who are troubled have peace of mind, that our shame be redeemed, that wars and violence stop in your name, that our children and youth thrive, that the sick be healed and that we have the courage to pray for complete healing, even for ailments we think are incurable, because you are in us. Help us to be in your image of goodness and help. We pray that the upcoming Mosaic Delegate Session glorifies you, God, that all of creation be restored, that leaders of the world be led by love, that those who serve this church are well supported, that this church, our ministries, and our families, our friends, and our pets, be protected and enveloped in your love. God, we love you so much. We pray as Jesus taught his disciples. Our Father in heaven, holy is your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Yours is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, now and forever. Amen. Please rise for our sending. This week, I invite you to name the things that make you feel unworthy to be in God's presence. Bag them up and meet Jesus at the picnic table. Let him take all those things and make them and you into something new and better. Let's sing, Go My Friends in Grace. Sing the story number 57.